Okay, so assalamualaikum everyone. Uh, we are live. I'll just wait so that uh, some of the members could join in. Okay, uh, so before I uh, jump into the session and invite the guest, I just wanted to say one thing uh, before I introduce. Um, uh, that I've seen whenever I uh, see something and I observe something, I always want to share it with the members because uh, this is, I think, part of the awareness. Uh, just so that everybody should be very cautious. Uh, I know uh, social media has so many platforms uh, for regarding awareness and education for children with special needs, but, which is a very good thing. But unfortunately, I've seen few of uh, the groups that are not giving the authentic information and are not giving enough knowledge and they are more focused towards the medication part uh, so I'm not saying that my group is the only authentic one but whenever in any platform you read something new you see something new you hear something new please research about it and always question it always question always ask always have uh, um, like take tips from professionals so you exactly know if this is the right thing or not for your child or yourself. Okay, so saying that, um, I will um, start the session today. I am uh, very much honored because the guest today, I think in my, in my eyes, he's an icon and hope to so many people, uh, including me. And uh, what I cherish about uh, his his work and him is not that just he uh, overcame his struggles and uh, handled his life so well, but he's uh, helping others as well. And he's open about it. He's open and he's telling his story. I think this is a, something very remarkable and very rare to find because uh, I believe that we should have this attitude in our life that where whenever we meet someone, they know something that we don't. So we should learn from each other. And that is, I think, the biggest knowledge that we can receive, not just from books, but people that we uh, see and meet. Uh, and I think today, in to, uh, today's session, we are going to learn so many things and, uh, uh, and have this hope that uh, even with so many uh, hurdles, a child can overcome these problems. Every struggle is different. Every child is different. Doesn't mean that if one person has done something, it will be applicable to uh, every child. It's not that. But just to have that hope, okay, okay, there is a chance that a child can do something better with his life or her life. So saying that, I will uh, uh, join uh, Fazli on the screen and he is going to introduce himself. Uh, hello, Slaikum Fazli. Hello, Should I How start? are you? Thank you so I'm much fine. for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, so can you firstly give us a little uh, introduction to yourself and then we'll start talking about your journey. Right. So uh, for the la I think since 2006, which is about 14 years ago, when I uh, found out about Asperger's syndrome and autism spectrum disorders and got a diagnosis when I was older. I was about 25 years old back then. Uh, since then, uh, I have been trying to help a lot of uh, pediatricians, doctors, special educators across the world, primarily Pakistanis or parents who live in Pakistan or parents who migrated abroad. And they found me by searching me on the internet or searching for people in Pakistan or even uh, people abroad, uh, including uh, networks of special educators, networks of self-advocates, network of doctors researchers across the world and the interesting thing has been that uh, since I've uh, there's not a lot of self-advocates in fact for autism I would say I'm probably the second I was the first one in, in 2006 and now there's Ahmad Siddiqui uh, in Karachi an IB graduate who's also self-advocate he's I think started his journey of self-advocacy last year 2019 he's now is a Facebook page and uh, but so a country of 220 million people for you know 25 percent of the earth's population lives in south asia why are there so many so few self-advocates why only two from pakistan why only perhaps a handful from south asia in fact uh, if you look at the region there's if you look at the conferences and the documentation that's happened 
Uh, I worked uh, on research papers and publications, and books have come out with collaborations with researchers and self advocates. And I'm usually usually the only one from South Asia representing the entire region. Why aren't other people coming forward? A lot of it has to do with media portrayals. A lot of it has to do with um, fear. You know, society basically there's a fear of prejudice, fear of being different. Uh, the whole you see there's a debate in the West or that sort of called developed world called the neurodiversity question, like what is neurodiversity and can uh, autism, because it's not a disease, you know, a disease is something you get cured of. It's a condition, it's a syndrome, it's a lifelong condition. Uh, you get better at it, you get, uh, you know, better based on your uh, support and the kinds of accommodations and support you get from people around you. So, you know, what is neurodiversity? How does it play? As far as I personally go, because I, I speak for myself, uh, and which is, I'm, you know, every child on the spectrum is different. They're all unique. Uh, that's why it's called the autism spectrum of disorders, not just autism anymore. And uh, the reclassification by the DSM-4, which is how they diagnosed these conditions uh, in 2014 by the American Psychiatry Association, that basically uh, converted even Asperger syndrome into autism. Now it's a part of that yeah. condition. Yes. I identify with higher functioning autism or Asperger syndrome. Uh, but keep in mind that, okay, so I was verbal as a child. I never lost my voice, but I've met special educators. I've met self-advocates while traveling abroad. I've spent days with them, you know, interviewed them and gotten feedback from them, read their books, read, saw their movies, uh, people like Dr. Temple Grandin, people like Dr. Stephen Shore. Now, these were non-verbal children on the extreme end of the spectrum. They were told by their parents that this would be institutionalized. And you know nothing progressive would happen with them, but their parents, for whatever reasons, had the financial ability and capability, and did not listen to doctors who told them that they should be institutionalized, and they kept working at them. They took them to speech therapists, they took them to uh, all kinds of pediatricians, neurologists, uh, you know, special educators, and they did not use uh, because I guess in some cases they may have required medicine or not. I'm not certain uh, about the medical part of it. For example, there's a lot of uh, comorbidity with epilepsy and other yeah. conditions, which does require medication. But in 50% yeah. cases, it does not. There is no epilepsy, at least in research documentation. So in, in situations where children were non-verbal through support of speech language pathologists, uh, ABA therapy, or, or other structured teaching or other therapies that have been uh, you know, scientifically proven to uh, show effect uh, when done through early intervention uh, over a period of time, and these people uh, were able to uh, live with their condition, live with their syndrome. They were able to adapt, work with society, progress, learn, self-teach. They become independent, become experts in their fields, become professors, become teachers, academics, researchers, and contribute not just to their own lives, but to the lives of people across the world through their books, their publications, their interviews, and media portrayals. So that is something that I believe uh, I work on, aside from my work, professional work. I. I try to uh, you know advise people as much as I can. I'm very careful about it in a country like Pakistan because I am a Pakistani and our laws do not allow a medical advice yeah. from a non-medical person. I'm not a doctor. I never claim to be a doctor. I'm not a special educator. I use my own story. I use my own life. I use what I've read and the experiences that I've gained over the years uh, to help and advise. And that's all I do. Uh, I don't go beyond that because I'm not qualified to do so. Uh, and that's something I want to make clear that sometimes uh, people, uh, you know, as you mentioned in your opening statement, that there are a lot of people looking for cures. There are a lot of yeah. people who claim to have a cure for these conditions. And if you know, if there was a cure, then the whole world would be following that, you know. Uh, True. But, uh, and these uh, the special education does help children. Uh, exposure to external stimuli and social conditions does help these children. A lot of the therapies that are taught and by, you know, in, Experts in Pakistan are using therapies that are used abroad. They do help these children. They, we have evidence, scientific evidence, and proof that these things work. So do not underestimate what your child is capable of. Through neuroplasticity, yeah. the child can adapt. The child will adapt and learn. And if there's something that the child cannot do, then stop trying to force your child to do that thing. Because there are other things that your child can do, that yeah. your child can function through, and use those as a way into the world of your child to help educate and make that condition and progress their their uh, abilities and uh, minimize their sensory overload and increase their outcomes. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Uh, firstly, I just wanted to like, uh, if 
as long as you can remember and you're comfortable. Uh, like you uh, said that you were diagnosed at the age of uh, 25? Yes. Okay. I, so, I, I, yes. Yeah. So uh, if going back a little bit in your childhood, uh, how did you feel things? How did you see things? How was the relationship with your family? How did that affect? And uh, can you talk about that a little? Yes, I can. So uh, throughout my life, uh, I've only maybe had two friends uh, and that's it. And uh, both were, I guess, people I started with or, you know, and so on, and they moved on. Uh, so as far as uh, going back all that, you know, time, sensory overload was a big problem while growing up. I was very uh, sensitive to smells, to sounds, uh, to certain stimuli. Uh, to vibrations in the ground, uh, you know, we used, to, we used to wake up at night uh, based on the sounds of fan or some sound from the outside. So very sensitive to hearing, very sensitive to loud noises, to like in the, in the classroom, example, the bell rings and the periods over, you know, when the class ends. Yeah. So that sound was very painful. The, the sound of children crying was very painful. The sound of, uh, you know, washing dishes, very painful. And a certain sound above a certain pitch level, I could actually hear them. Example, if there's fluctuation or the tube light is on, I can actually hear it. Or the television is on, I can actually hear that sound that the TV is on, and the picture tube. Even if uh, you so, were not there in the room? Yes, even even there. Okay. Like a few rooms away, I could, I, it was that sensitive. Again, every child is different, but for my thing, it was very, very sensitive. As okay. far as the... So, uh, uh, you were mentioning that you used to feel pain, like it was painful. So how, what kind of a pain you felt? Well, uh, the first, you see, when you example loud sound or any kind of sound, the first, uh, okay, let me try to give a analogy, for example. Uh, so for me, it's like, you know, if you, if you cut your finger, if mm. it gets cut accidentally, right? The first thing you feel is that sudden pain. And then yeah. you feel a throbbing pain, a pulsing pain. You know, yeah. when the blood is flowing in or out and you put a bandage, on it or something and then slowly slowly it reduces that's the kind of pulsing you know that you feel when because of sensory overload issues uh, and for example uh, let's say the sand on my skin you know it was very it was like uh, insects walking on skin it was very irritating so certain textures were irritating uh, for example metal on my skin like i used to avoid going to the barber because they used to use a steel uh, you know like scissor to cut hair and that sensation my skin was very painful but i couldn't i didn't have the words to explain because my communication was very uh formulaic it was there was a lot of echolalia i used to repeat okay. questions back at people uh, so they just thought i was being polite when i'm going around asking people you know if they want water when in reality that was a question that i had learned you know do you want water and i used to go around asking that to other people so that they would give me water when i didn't understand that you know the context of the grammar or the meaning of language. It was very formulaic uh, for many, many years. Uh, and it, it through experience, through learning, through seeing stuff on television, things started becoming a bit more clearer by experience. Uh, so these were a few examples. Uh, any other question? Yes, so um, at this the, uh, the scenario that you just mentioned, this was about mm -hmm. the age? This is from the what ages, age probably from my member maybe from age three to age uh, 20, pretty much so. Okay. So for a very long okay. period of time, because you have to understand that uh, only around maybe age 18 or 19 did I actually start understand what was different with me. And this uh, happened very suddenly. What was going on was that, you know, you go to these family weddings and they make mm -hmm. like a video, you know, of everything. And then sometimes when the wedding is over, everyone sit down and watches that video. So I kept looking at my own physical behavior in those videos. And my behavior was very different uh, from the behavior of other people. I wasn't making eye contact in those videos. I was sitting in a corner or probably trying to ignore people and things like that. So I, I when I saw that, when I saw myself in the video, and technically uh, what I'm describing you to you is now a therapy called video modeling that's actually being used in the United States uh, in the last five or six years, that they show videos of a child's own behavior to themselves later on. And then the child can easily spot out the difference because children on the spectrum sometimes have pattern recognition, uh, recognition abilities and they're able to tell things that are different 
or not in sequence and they're able to point out that difference like for example you had these puzzles where you could spot out like which is the different letter in a whole page of letters yeah. right or a spelling mistake yeah. i could do that in very very fast speed uh, so it was something that i probably used and reverse understood to understand uh, you know that i was different so i the first thing i did was try to change how i appeared in public my behavior in public uh, so i used to sit like other people you know look like other people you know talk like other people just imitate and that imitation allowed general uh, greater social acceptance uh, of mm -hmm. me among you know and that led to my career success later on at a later stage okay so at home uh, you uh, how many siblings you had only one sister, nine years older. Older. Okay. So, uh, did you ever communicate it in your family that you are facing these issues, and how did they react to it? Yeah. So, one thing that a lot of people don't talk about is that autism is not something new. It's been going on for thousands of years. If you yeah. look at, if you ask parents who have children on the spectrum, and if you look at their symptoms, if you explain that to the parents, and you ask, well. How were your parents behaving? How were the grandparents behaving? Did you have any other members in your family that had similar kinds of behavior? And the majority of cases, I'm quite confident that that will be the case, that you may have had other people in the family with similar behavior. Such was the case in my family. There have been other members of my family uh, similarly, uh, uh, you know, with my behaviors in the past also. Uh, so this was not something new. This was something that had been there for perhaps many generations, and it was just something that had been passed on, you know, like, for example, late speech, you know, occurrence of speech was, for example, late, uh, you know, or there's something like, uh, you know, uh, epilepsy, uh, a lot of people have these seizures and, uh, you know, so it, in my uh, case, it's just like a shock, uh, you know, it just jolts you and then you kind of maybe you, you get paused for a few seconds and then yeah. you can continue doing whatever you want. I see that. I've been a teacher for over a decade, uh, well, nearly 15 years now, and a lot of my students also exhibit, on, I'm assuming they're undiagnosed, they don't, they're not aware of it. A lot of, it's very common among, you know, students in Pakistan, uh, like, yeah. uh, like for example, if they're nervous, they're tapping their feet, or they're tapping the pen, or they're fiddling with their fingers, or they're stretching, you know, they're cracking their knuckles, and these are all things which uh, have a physical, biological connection to. Uh, the release of dopamine, which actually calms people down, particularly those on the autism spectrum. So these are behaviors which are very common among people on the spectrum. They're very common among the population. And I believe the amount of people diagnosed in Pakistan, obviously, is a very small amount of people. And hence, it is underdiagnosed. I believe the condition is much more wider than uh, than recognized or, or you know, yeah. realized. Absolutely. So uh, how uh, when you... Uh, thought that there are things that are those are different from others so were you did you communicate that to your family i didn't have the language to do so also uh, a factor that my mother was not a undergrad she just probably was a matriculation graduate so she did not understand the science or the academia of things so she obviously did had no idea but obviously was very supportive but uh, and she had known these stories that, you know, were passed down generation to generation, different kinds of behaviors and what to do. Example, if a child is uh, crying up when among strangers, like, for example, when the strangers used to come in my house when I was young, I used to hide underneath my bed. I didn't like talking or meeting strangers and making eye contact and listening to them. And uh, I was trying to copy my cat uh, at that time, who obviously also was very shy and used to hide under the bed when strangers used to come in. So, so things like that. But uh, as I said, uh, you know, uh, my parents at that time uh, were remembering all those things that their parents had told them and so on and so on. So they were using these sort of old stories or you know things like that. But as uh, talking to them as uh, when I was young, I did, as I said, I didn't have any friends. Uh, just two and for a limited short period of time. Uh, and then uh, I so I was different. I used to play by myself, play you know on my own, and I preferred learning on my own alone in the room. Uh, reading things myself as opposed to learning in school or you know in a public environment where there's a lot of people and a lot of activity going on uh, so my behavior was different of course as a child and i'm sure my parents realized that but as i said i wasn't the only one like this not at all there's other members of the family other ancestors or other people before me and they turned out same similar to what i am today uh, so i don't think that was that much of a concern as far as 
making them understand after I got diagnosed, yes, I now had the language to explain to them. And obviously, they tried to understand the best they could. And obviously, were supportive of it. But as I said, at that before that, I mean, I wish I had that language at a younger age. I wish I knew about these terms, these conditions, and uh, to explain what is going on in my head and you know how I'm reacting to something because I didn't have that language. I didn't know how to explain. I didn't have like for example, if I didn't make eye contact, then for me, you know, I thought the whole world was like this. I thought the whole world didn't make eye contact. Or if I had mm-hmm. issue with the scissors and you know uh, with uh, cutting my hair and so on, so I thought everyone's like this. I just didn't realize you know, that that's not neurotypical or. Okay, and you mentioned that you have been verbal uh, since your childhood, but the, like you just mentioned verbal that you didn't echo, have the language. Echo, yeah. 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 So I just wanted echo, to yeah. if you elaborate what were the communication issues you had? Yeah. Other so I think till the, till the age of 18 or nine, uh, you know, 17 or 18, I generally didn't have conversations with people on all subjects. I only had con conversations on the subjects which were of my not interest but obsession like i was for example obsessed with the concept of dinosaurs or you know cartoons or a few other things and i just used to talk only about those subjects because i was interested in them and all my conversations eventually used to shift people towards that so my conversational ability was limited to a few subjects of my interest only i realized that at a later stage uh, also uh, as far as the communication point because i mentioned that I didn't understand the, the the actual semantics of language, uh, you know. So I learned that later on by watching these TV sitcoms where people are expressing humor. For example, the Friends TV series or Archie right. comics, or you know, comics where you understand socialization and jokes like Tintin or Asterix. You know, these were all comics where a lot of humor was there, and and subtle humor. And I understood only by these examples what humor is, how it's employed, because People certainly weren't laughing when they used to talk to me, you know, or they weren't uh, able to, let's I wasn't able to laugh or understand their jokes, you know. So that whole, the whole socialization context becomes very boring, very, uh, not very friendly, I guess, if you don't understand the social context of humor. So that was learned at a much later stage when I got access to comics and TV shows and sitcoms and computer games and things like that. The media, self-teaching really allowed me to, re- because as I mentioned, I had lack of eye contact when young. So I probably miss out on a lot of these interactions when younger than a child. Okay, uh, so t- if we are talking about your childhood, how did you manage like uh, uh, toilet training or eating habits or things like that? How did you uh, f- handle those issues? Or were they uh, not an issue? At, uh, at well, most of them were not, but I believe food was a challenge because uh, I had uh, like stomach aches sometimes with certain kinds of food and obviously uh, it was very hard to ex- explain that certain foods are causing problems. For example, a lot of the milk, uh, you know, like dairy products were just touch and go, you know, like 50% of the time I was fine with them and 50% of the time this just gave me a stomach ache or something like that, right? So I had to l- become careful about my food later on when I realized that this is one of those things. Uh, and also regarding the food, uh, my since I said I had sensory issues that I could uh, literally you know hear, and also my my smell sense of smell was also very sensitive. That means that I can smell what's cooking and I can smell the ingredients. And if something doesn't taste okay, like for example, karele or you know if you if you make them uh, like mm-hmm. karela juice and things yeah. like that, so I you know, I can smell that they're bad or, or like fish, you know it, it smells horrible. If you don't cook it properly, you know it's a very strong smell, or perhaps things with too much pears or things like that. So uh, I had to be careful among those because if something was, as I said, too strong as a smell, uh, it used to cause sensory overload. It should just made me nauseous or, you know, literally throw up. So I have to be uh, careful or mindful of these things. So I used to sometimes walk around with a, a you know, like a perfume tissue or a scented tissue and just put that in my nose if the smell of food was just getting too overpowering or bearing. I didn't have the communication or the language ability to explain that to other people. So I, that's why the whole avoiding people kind of helped in that process, you know, being far away from a kitchen or far away from places where the smell was strong. And 
the smell effect generally comes. So what I discovered when I was very young, uh, I think a very young age, possibly the age of four or five, was that sometimes I can uh, use my hyper focus ability on focus on a certain thing and block out other senses. And what happened, how I discovered it was by reading. I was reading sometimes in environments where there was a lot of people around me to kind of avoid social contacts. So I didn't want to talk to people, I didn't want to make eye contact. So I used to always have a book in my hand. And that allowed me to focus on the words of the text. And somehow, for some reason, it used to shut down the sound around me and it used to shut down the smell of people and things around me. So I used that as a defense mechanism. Uh, and later on, I transitioned to proprioception. That basically means uh, pressure. So what I was uh, five, just through accident, I found out that uh, when I have plasticine or clay in my hands and I keep pressing it, the pressure actually diverts all my senses. And I, I again, kind of a hyper focus mechanism. It allows me to divert my senses. So that means that I could ignore loud sounds. I could ignore, uh, you know, smells, strong smells or bright lights. If I had something always in my hand, what people now call a squeeze toy. I think yeah. it's very common among people on yes. the yeah. occupational yeah. therapist use it. So in a way, it was doing the same thing that a squeeze toy would do. Or people, mm. your typicals would have something like a stress reliever. You know, they sometimes have a squeeze ball. It was doing the same thing, kind of an effect for me. Uh, yeah. So it helps to focus yes. more and then block all the other senses that yes. were distracting you. Yes, because I mentioned that for in the cases of Asperger syndrome or higher functioning autism, a lot of uh, people, self-advocates, have written about something called hyperfocus, where you focus on one particular thing and it tries to, it blocks the senses and it blocks the other external stimuli around you, which allows you to then minimize those senses. This is the same mechanism biologically that's used in uh, acupuncture, because what happens in acupuncture is when you are sticking, like you have a pain in a certain part of your body, then you stick a pain in some other part of your body, and that pain basically gets keeps getting diverted. You know, and so that mechanism, I believe, was the biological underpinnings of uh, the system that I was using automatically. I didn't know what it was. I was doing it because it calmed me down. It made me uh, survive in that hostile sort of sensory. So how thing. did you figure this out, that you were able to block some of the senses and focus on just one? Trial and error. Mm -hmm. Because I had a good memory. I was remembering pretty, I had episodic memory. That means I could remember a lot of things very well. I've even read about this in the books of Temple Grandin. Uh, she also writes about it, that uh, sometimes you know things were just challenging for her. So she used to remember a lot of details about the challenging situations and try to think about them over many days as in what could be the one thing that was causing a problem and simulate different situations and then try them out experimentally in a logical manner, in a methodical manner, taking things off one by one. What was it? What was it? What was it? And so on. Because of the determination point of view, because of the hyper focus, I was able to consolidate and isolate those points and thereby eliminate them. Okay. And uh, uh, people say that children who have autism have, have very, um, very um, strong visual uh, learning. So, how are you with that? Uh, I would say, you see, because it's a spectrum, not every child is the same. Of course. The same. Yeah. But uh, a lot of the, I would say, the majority of anecdotal evidence that we have, particularly from self-advocates who have described uh, their learning or how they think or how they view the world around them. Uh, yes, visual acuity is there, but I would like to add three things to it, which are not talked about too much. Uh, there's a book called The Autistic Brain by Dr. Tepper Grandin that also talks about these uh, parameters. One of them, uh, which I believe special educators should be aware of that the, the kind of uh, memory or connectivity uh, between memories that children have is actually episodic. That basically means that if a child is suddenly crying or laughing randomly with no external stimuli, this actually means that the child is actually remembering a memory from their past, a memory that made them happy, a memory that made them sad. And this is- They are recalling the, something. Yeah, they are recalling something. And the reason why they're recalling something is not because they're trying to escape the world around them. It's because their their brain is trying to protect themselves from sensory overload by distracting them. The same mechanism as I pointed out in proprioception or in acupuncture, that because the sensory overload is becoming a point of pain, it's painful now. So the brain is trying to make the child think of a happier time, a happier memory. 
and that's when maybe the child was perhaps laughing during that memory. Maybe we saw a video on YouTube or a cartoon where they laughed a few days ago. Now, when that memory is playing back in their mind, that's why they're responding accordingly to it. It's like a virtual reality glasses have been put on and they're watching that movie. And obviously, they're ignoring the world around them while this is happening. This is a way for the brain to kind of accommodate and uh, sort of survive in that situation where the current stimulus externally is causing pain. Hence, the child, the brain is now distracting the child with something of a better memory of a better time. So that's something that happens quite commonly, and a lot of people don't talk about it. Uh, they think that the child is just not being there, but the child is there. It's just that their sensory overload is causing them pain, and they're trying to, their brain is trying to protect them. Hence, the second thing that uh, is also uh, occurring uh, is uh, situations where uh, you have uh, children who are unable to understand something, uh, as in something is confusing or not making sense. Now, you have to understand from the point of view that uh, all children don't learn the same way. For example, if a child is seeing something, that may contribute to learning, but there are other ways of sensing the world around us. So, for example, if a child cannot understand something which they're seeing visually, then they must touch that object. They must hold it in their hand. For example, if it's a letter A or a letter B, even though they can see perfectly, but sometimes they don't understand something unless they touch it. The, the tactile pressure, the proprioception of it, that triggers understanding of something that's physically there. You know, so sometimes you need to hold it in your hand to understand it, or sometimes you need to smell it for it to actually exist in their brain. The concept of an object as an artifact to understand if it physically exists is only possible through something of a memory association. So if a child has smelled something in the past and they smell something again which sounds similarly smelling, now they can associate it with memory and it's stored. It's stored and it's then contextually there as opposed to being invisible for that child. For example, a lot of parents in, in literature have described their children treating themselves, treating the parent as a piece of furniture, meaning ignoring the, the parent, that they're actually physically there. In that situation, if the, if the parent is trying mm -hmm. to talk to the child or maybe uh, you know trying to wave in front of them if that's not working maybe they can hold the child's like elbow or you know shoulder and physically touch the child and then speak or show something in front of them and then a picture if they're making like a white contact and then speak or other methods of getting their attention a lot of cases we've seen especially with children who are nonverbal who have sensory overload issues uh, that Sometimes they are lost in their own world and then trying to do something and they're ignoring everyone around them. In that situation, it's been scientifically tested that all you have to do to get their attention is just repeat what they're doing. Example, if the child is jumping in the air or hand flapping and ignoring you, then you also just do that thing. Or if the child is rolling on the floor or they're playing with the, the, they're turning the wheels on a toy car and just ignoring the world around them, then you also mm. start doing the same thing. And suddenly, because now they have a visual context and they're seeing that you're imitating them, the connection will of communication will automatically start. You have to repeat what they're doing. What, okay. uh, so, you and know, this is going to be helpful even yes. for uh, children who are nonverbal? Yes, especially for children who are nonverbal because they have a greater challenge in terms of the communication aspect because they can sometimes tell what they are thinking and what they are trying to communicate. So they perhaps need to, uh, sometimes these children are taught sign language, they're taught augmented communication through using, you know, like sign boards or uh, text to speech or other devices which help them communicate better or even sign language, I've seen sign language also. Uh, but uh, again, it's that's up to the speech language pathologist too advice on that matter. Okay. And did you ever feel th that ke your uh, high sensory needs are uh, not able to, uh, because of that, you are not able to develop the language properly? Is Was that uh, possible? Uh, language, as I said, was not missing. It was just confusing for a very long period of time. Possibly, as I said, till the age of 19 or 20, uh, socially, uh, social interaction was always a challenge. Uh, I had to learn it literally uh, by watching either set TV shows and popular games and uh, comic books and so on. Uh, but as I said, uh, the language was there, but not entirely there because I didn't understand the context or the meaning of it. 
Uh, so I've seen in a lot of cases that even children who haven't even learned how to, uh, let's say, speak yet, even children who are growing up, parents can even teach them sign language or communicate with them in certain sounds that they can speak, uh, even at a very young age. So there are other ways of communication other than voice, which is sometimes underdeveloped because of other underlying muscular conditions or un undiagnosed issues regarding neurology or again, you know, neuroplasticity. Again, uh, there's a lot of variation in this and a lot of parents usually talk about their child being nonverbal at a young age. So I guess you should possibly consult a, a speech language pathologist, but I would like to add something that I've learned uh, by visiting our neighboring countries conferences over there. I met a lot of researchers and they're working on something that just is scientifically strange to explain. What they've discovered is that even a child, now I repeat very clearly, even a child who is non-verbal, but who is able to hum sounds, who is able to like learn music, can technically, even biologically, is able to speak or sing, or sing those words. Now this seems very strange that if a child actually cannot say hello or actually answer back. How in the world can they sing? Because the part of the brain that deals with speech and the part of the brain that deals with music is not the same part. It's actually a different part. And we've seen a lot of children across the world who actually were not able to speak, but they were able to listen to music, appreciate music, play music, and eventually uh, you know, try to hum the sounds or the songs and eventually a majority of them were able to develop speech by the, the words of those songs, actually singing. And their parents and special creators used to talk to them in a sing-song voice. And that actually promoted the neuroplasticity of their brains to actually use a different pathway to develop language. And again, this is a new research. There's a lot of work being done on it. And I guess you have to consult your speech language pathologist and I actually met one of the scientists who are working on this. This is Dr. Eve Marie Nussporter, it's, it's very mm. name, from Dortmund University in Germany. Uh, and I actually met her at a conference in India. And she's been working for the last, I don't know, 10 years or so. And there's a lot of other scientists across the world, even in South Asian countries, also trying to repeat this phenomenon. That's really amazing. I think it's very interesting. And I think that uh, what you said earlier is that, that even if your child is not communicating in how we communicate, there are so many other ways that the child is, is able to communicate. That's amazing. OK, uh, coming to another side, did you ever develop social anxiety? Because you were not able to do eye contact. You were not uh, able to communicate with them in the proper way because the language was confusing. So did you ever develop social anxiety? And, and children, I, who, do you have any advice for them? I would say social anxiety never left. I still have it. So what generally happens is that uh, when going through a situation where, let's say, I would have to answer questions or something, in that situation, I try to read up, I try to do my research, I try to find out about that situation before that situation happens. And that's what allows me to sort of uh, learn or navigate or prepare in a way. And that leads to a reduction in that potential anxiety problem. So I do my research or I try to do as much as I can before a situation happens in order to reduce that. I plan ahead, basically. OK, so if a child uh, is uh, avoiding so because mostly they do avoid uh, uh, public places or gatherings because they have the social anxiety. So how should parents, because parents then then force the child to yeah. either. So, uh, so yeah. yeah, so what should so they do? This is, again, a very common question. And uh, I've seen uh, different implementations of this in other countries also. Uh, there are generally a couple of steps that people try out the world and they generally seem to succeed in most cases. Uh, the first thing is that every child has a particular interest, and sometimes that interest is an obsession, or sometimes they have an area where they really like a certain thing, like they like cats, or they like dogs, or they like dinosaurs, or a particular cartoon, or Lego, or a particular thing, a toy that they play with. 
So these play dates are normally organized with other parents of special needs children where they're put into an environment. They're not forced to pair up with each other or play with each other. They just put up in a room with different toys and they play with those toys. And eventually, over time, they get comfortable with the other children, they start sharing, they start showing each other, and they start interacting based on a common interest. So that's something we observed in the past that even though a child may not be playing with other children, but if they're in the same room, they're actually looking and they're learning and they're hearing. Their learning never stops. The neuroplasticity continues for those children. So being in that environment where those children exist, that is helpful. And that environment contains all the other things. Now, in my situation, what was making me go to all these social events that my parents were forcing me to go to? Every event that I went to, I was allowed to have plasticine in my hand. I was given a new book or a comic, and that was kind of a bribe in a way in order for me to behave myself or to remain there while my parents met their friends or went to some social gathering because otherwise I was not motivated to leave my room. I was just want to stay and play my toys all the time, not even go to school. So that was how my parents sort of knew that I loved reading and I loved comic books and I loved plasticine and toys and other things. Uh, so and plasticine to making toys with that also allowed me to divert sort of attention from me because then people would focus on the things I'm creating as opposed to me and not talk with me and focus on what I was doing which was some non-verbal activity, right? So I used to use these strategies to kind of avoid attention, avoid conversations socially. And my parents probably realized that that's one way to motivate or use those things to uh, kind of encourage me to go with them to different events and places. And then that those things helped you when you were there? Yeah. That's what, yeah, so yes. as you said, that those things helped you to uh, in your hyper-focus. Yes. And important aspect, schooling. How did you manage schooling, learning, academics, interaction with students, and all of that? So as I said, uh, my memory was potentially episodic. I used to remember a lot of things. So I, I never used to learn inside the school. But I used to write down just like, you know, they used to give you homework. Like these things have to be done. And my mother used to help me with that homework when I used to come home. And in, in most cases, obviously, as I said, my mother uh, never completed her graduation, never did her undergrad. So at, at a certain point in age, I used to do my own homework. And I used to learn more on by myself, going through that content, that book again, uh, repeatedly, you know, at home, uh, before I used to be allowed to watch cartoons and play and all of those things. Uh, so I was actually teaching myself whatever I learned at school again, because School was a very distracting, random environment. You know, sounds going off, loud noises, people distraction, screaming, all kinds of things. It's not a very uh, productive environment because it wasn't. It wasn't. You know, there's too much noise, and I mm -hmm. didn't have the words to explain that this noise was actually distracting. But did you look forward to go to school, or did you want to avoid it? I I, I never went look forward to go to school. No, mm -hmm. simply not because of the learning. I liked learning. I didn't like the social interaction and the bullying because my behavior was different. And obviously, other children can detect that maybe. And you know, so didn't used to get along with people. OK, a very important question. I'm, I'm Now I'm asking you as a mother, how mm -hmm. did you deal with bullying? Were you ever bullied? Were people used to make fun of you? Yes. And how did you cope yeah. with that? All the time. So I used to just avoid, avoid people. And I used to focus, as I said, instead of what I cannot do, I used to focus on what I can do. So the things that I was good at, for example, I mentioned plasticine toys and artwork and you know computers eventually. That was my strength of area of strength. And uh, other people around me became sort of you know interested that I was very good in these areas. And eventually I was advising people. If somebody's heart has failed, I used to recover data for them, for example. You know, in class eight or nine, you know, I was hardly a kid back then. So these things were and I had learned these things by watching other people do them. Just by you know staring at their bags, for example, my father had a printing press, uh, and you know, there were graphic designers that I used to hire, and I used to just look at their bags and you know what they're doing, and when they went uh, you know uh, like home, I used to play computer games on those same computers, and I used to just open up the software and just start to repeat what they were doing, and I taught myself graphic design over a couple of years. So it's it's a lot of doing stuff by myself on my own, uh, you know that led to these processes okay and uh, that helped you to not focus on the negativity around you in yes the, because i was happier doing things alone 
how were the teachers with you did you un did they understand your limitations or did they like used to impose you uh, impose there were only two kinds of teachers one that liked me and one that didn't like me uh, there was no middle ground so what was going on is if i was if i liked the subject then i was the first person to raise my hand you know every time a teacher is asking a question i was the first one to raise my hand and that obviously made me very unpopular in class because students don't like that if one person keeps answering on the questions uh, but the teacher of course was happy that i was taking such an interest in the subject there weren't many subjects but there were some subjects like that like chemistry what subjects did you like chemistry computer science were pretty much two subjects that i was really interested in uh, okay and as far as uh, teachers who didn't like me were probably the urdu teachers and the maths teachers because i used to ask questions all the time i didn't get what they're talking about and they used to get very irritated when i kept asking questions and different questions and different questions and a point came in which i think at the uh, o level age or the university undergrad level that i used to start getting thrown out of classes i used to get literally thrown out because i was just asking too many questions and sometimes the teachers got offended in fact in, in a couple of my classes I, at the undergrad level i believe uh, i offended teachers because i actually questioned their knowledge because i was looking at things online on the internet and what they were teaching was something that happened 15 20 years ago that was now obsolete that i could scientifically prove that what they're talking is actually wrong it's not based on current knowledge or current science as taught around the world but since they were using textbooks that were printed 15 years ago obviously they were teaching obsolete information and i said that out and obviously people get offended so yes that also happened a lot so uh, even by the whole school age it was trial and error you didn't know about your diagnosis no. so what uh, after school what uh, made you uh, go to get yourself a diagnosis well my cousin uh, you know he's older than me he lives in a special uh, need school live in school and you know he he was i would say he was a non verbal but let's just say he's lower on the spectrum you know he had intellectual deficiencies and all kinds of issues were growing up so i was aware that there is something like that uh, you know and obviously distant cousins like third cousin fourth cousin you know people like that i've always seen very very distant that there were cases where i was aware of that you know special needs or some extreme challenges and other things and so i was aware of it uh, and also what was going on is that uh, at the age of 25 were an article about uh, bram cohen who basically invented bit torrent bit torrent was a it's a piracy system that's used to download pirated software across the world and the article mentioned that uh, he wasn't prosecuted by the fbi because uh, they proved in court that he had asperger syndrome and now obviously i was in the way of such a thing i said okay what's this i was looking i looked it up when i looked at the wikipedia page it's, i just literally fell off my chair uh, because i couldn't uh, for the first time in my life every single line in that article uh, you know it applied to my life and for the first time i for, i had the language to explain to people what has been going on my entire life i could finally explain word by word line by line of what happens in my head and how i think and how i'm different now from others i finally had that language that caused me to email experts of autism around the world they were not in pakistan so i emailed dr darrell trafford uh, you know in the us Dr. Simon Baron Cohen, University of Cambridge, uh, in the, you know, Oxford, uh, and other experts, uh, Dr. Tony Atwood, Australia. And obviously, these were names that popped up on you know on Google. You search autism expert, their names came up. And obviously, they didn't reply to me immediately. And you know, who am I? I'm just a random kid from Pakistan. Uh, and but what I was able to contact was Dr. John Vincent, uh, Canadian Institute of Medics, Addiction and Mental Health, and in in Canada. And he was a genetic researcher doing a research on study on. uh you know uh, to parent, families or uh, with large numbers of people on the autism spectrum uh from pakistani families or arab families or indian families because a lot of people who migrate to canada do have children on the autism spectrum and it's causing a burden on their uh, special needs and you know health policies and insurance and all kinds of things it's a, it's a causing uh, issue there so they basically were researching the sort of the genetic components and in part of a larger study on the human genome project and uh, i also give my blood sample to him and he's the one who sort of diagnosed me and he was a lot of a lot of other people were with him they were uh, visiting uh, 
there was this uh, psychiatric conference in Lahore at that time uh, at the Mayo Hospital, uh, and they were here in in Pakistan to visit that. There was Dr. Douglas Blackwood from University of Edinburgh in Scotland. There was Dr. Mohammed Ayub from the you know Mayo Hospital. So these people they came actually to my house and visited me and met me. They're the ones who actually confirmed the diagnosis. Uh, again, this is about 2006, age 25. Uh, and uh, at that time, I tried to, you know, visit Aya Khan. I contacted special educators over there, but uh, pediatricians and so on. They said that they are not qualified to give adult diagnosis because they've never done so in their in their career or academic record. Again, this is 2006. Obviously, I'm sure things are much better now, and people are experiencing giving adult diagnosis. But there was not at that time. Uh, so and so, what happened is by contacting all of these parents and special education groups and other self advocates across the world. It connected me to a network of self-advocates and people across the world. There was a huge movement for autism and special needs at that time, where people were coming together and talking about it, sharing ideas, going to conferences. And that suddenly, because of my post on the Pakistan Autism Meetup Group online, which was started by Sara Saman back in 2005, approximately during that time. Uh, she was a parent who then migrated later on to Canada uh, with the children. Uh, she basically, uh, and other parents and other mothers, I contacted with them. By my online posts in contact with other uh, Pakistani Russian doctors across the world who were on that uh, you know on that online forum, and they basically invited me to conferences in South Asia, different countries, India, Bangladesh, you know Qatar, uh, later on in the U.S., uh, later on in Bhutan, all these places, uh, and uh, I was able to network, uh, learn from experts, uh, even meet with WHO, United Nations representatives, uh, learn from them, you know contribute to their documentation. A lot of the work I've done recently is with the government of Bangladesh. You know, with uh, the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, her, her daughter, uh, she basically is the leading autism expert in, in her country. And I've done a lot of uh, contributed to research papers that have been published and being used by the government of Bangladesh right now and the UN right now for, you know, helping countries with underdiagnosis of adults and children on the autism spectrum. So all of these networkings and uh, interactions internationally were not emulated at the same level in Pakistan because our uh, basic media uh, usage has generally been awareness the morning shows pretty much it nothing beyond that but i did uh, and you know get interviewed and went to a lot of more tv morning shows uh, uh, and appeared there and sort of answer the questions spread awareness the you know, most i could but i believe i've been able to do much more abroad actually as opposed to pakistan you know collaborating with all these, these uh, experts and doctors and pediatrician research across the world simply because they have the whole uh, legal framework of self-advocate, which doesn't exist in South Asia. I mean, I'm literally the only, as I said, I was the first one. Until mm -hmm. last year, I was the only one in Pakistan. You know, that's just not enough. We need more people to come forward, more people to share their stories and make a difference. Absolutely. I think listening to you will definitely inspire many people. And, uh, okay, so uh, when you got your self-diagnosis, did you, yes. this, this ever thought occur to you that, now I'm 25. I've already overcome so many things. Why should I? Can you repeat what you're saying? I think the video paused. Hello? Yes. Can you repeat what you just said? Can you repeat what you said? Yes, yes. I asked you that uh, when you were getting your self-diagnosis, this, yes. this thought occurred to you that uh, I'm already 25. I've already uh, uh, overcome so many hurdles. So why should I get myself a label? Because this is what there is this uh, misconception by parents that if I get my child diagnosed, there will be this label on them. I think uh, in our part of the world in South Asia, disclosure is something that usually happens at a very young age. So when you have uh, you know, a school going child or a child that is getting admission to a university, you know, that, that is the place where they would actually require that documentation. You know, but if you look at situations where, like as I said, I had completed my undergrad education. You know, I had uh, done a lot of things. I, was, I had started working. And my employers were not concerned with this because I was performing as per the requirements. So they didn't care. You know, it was not a problem for yeah. them. Uh, so I didn't, in a way, need to disclose to them. But uh, for my parents, obviously, I told them for 
people like my doctors or other people who need it to know, you know, I, I do tell them. And for somebody who finds out about me, obviously, uh, they know. So I always try to advise them and help them out as much as possible I can. But as far as full disclosure or this being my only primary identity, in a, as I said, in, a, in an underdeveloped country with underdeveloped ideals or portrayals of autism or disability, uh, then, you know, it, it's just not possible for this to be my only identity. But let me give the example of what happens in the developed world, for example, in the West, where you have people that, who are self-advocates and this is their only identity. This is all they do, literally. Yeah. They just go to conferences, they represent, and they are people on the spectrum, openly and proud, and literally they get paid to do this all the time. You know, they write books, they, they go to different conferences, they are professional speakers, you hire them. That doesn't happen in our part of the world at all. Or at least not maybe in a couple of years, like every three or four years, but it's not that common. And it should be. That's the basic model for the self-advocate to exist in the legal framework. You know, not as a doctor, not as a special educator, yeah. but sort of a person that you can get advice from, you know. But that model simply mm -hmm. is new for our media because maybe the media is not promoting it or maybe it's not ready for it or society is not ready for it. But change is happening slowly, but surely it is happening. Yeah, true. And I think this is the what uh, I think this is what you said uh, that it should be the identity, not we should not treat it as a label. It should be it is it is who you are. It is what the child is. You need to accept it as their identity. OK, uh, there are a few questions that I wanted to ask you. And at any point, if you feel like you don't want to answer, you're not comfortable, please feel free uh, to say that. So uh, uh, one uh, two questions that uh, uh, come in the comment section and I want to talk about it also. What were your, were you ever curious about relationships and how did you deal with that? Uh, I don't think I had any relationships, uh, but, but uh, as far as now, um, well, the internet, you know, you just Google it and mm -hmm. you learn things. So I pretty much taught and learned through the internet and through books, self teaching. No one exactly taught me. Okay, and you were saying that for now you were you were saying something and then it got interrupted. Well, I'm married now. I just got married uh, in 2018, uh, December. Uh, I think it's been like you know, less than two years, nearly two years. Yeah. Okay, mashallah. Okay, and um, uh, an another question that I wanted to ask you that when children on a spectrum or uh, when they reach a uh, girl or a boy when they reach the age of puberty when like boys are starting having facial hairs this voice is starting changing how do parents deal with that either a non-verbal or a verbal child how to explain that yeah. to the child? you see now there's a book that i co-authored uh, it's called uh, been there and it's kind of crazy name. The, the the title is been there done that try this and aspie's guide to life on earth this was published in the UK, uh, and the editor is Dr. Tony Atwood of Australia, a very famous uh, doctor. And uh, uh, Temper Grandin also contributed essays to it. Now, this is not an area of my expertise. However, other self-advocates were also asked on the autism spectrum about, and they written entire chapters in this book. And you can even find excerpts of this book on books.google.com. If you search this name, been there, done that, try this, and Aspie's Guide to Life on Earth, yeah, I know it's a, it's a long title. Uh, you'll actually you can actually go through the book and see most of it online and read through it for free also. So I would suggest you uh, try that and read chapters of it pertaining to the subject. I'm not an expert on the subject. Okay. Okay. Actually, firstly, there are so many questions regarding your research and your publications. Can you uh, message me details and I can uh, paste all the details in the description of the video so that people can download or access to your uh, publications and researches will that be okay yes, I can. Yes. okay yes. so i i will uh, those who are asking i will add all the details in the description of the video okay there are a few questions i will just share yes. on the screen uh i think you have discussed this but uh, what were the indications that made you think that there is something different or unique about you well sensory overload issues 
were pretty uh, mm. much there. Lack of eye contact was there. Communication challenges were there. Uh, lack of friends. Um, other than that, uh, these were pretty huge things. I mean, this pretty much changes everything around you, you know, yeah. socialization. So, yeah. Mm. And uh, firstly, right now, yeah. when you overcame these things, did you do you still feel that pain when you have those when you hear those w w noises or when you smell certain foods? Do you still feel that pain? You see, I've through trial and error, through experimentation, I've figured out things that work exceptionally well for me. They might well work well for others. What I've discovered and this is a very strange thing, but it works for me, that for the hearing sensitivity, I used to actually wear these sound blocking headphones and you know sound blockers and mm. so on. But I mm. recognize I cannot do that while walking out in the public or going to university and teaching and so on. Uh, so what I did was that uh, men actually have hair on the ears. And I used tweezers and I removed those hairs. They're called cilia. And those hairs, and they basically pick up vibrations from the air around you. So what was actually going on from a medical or biological perspective is that I was hearing the sound and the vibrations of the other sounds, the lower tones and everything was also going into my brain through my ear. So I actually have removed all the hair on the ear because men at least have hair on the ear, yeah. this area. So there's no hair here. I used, I used to use hair removing cream, but that's painful. Uh, so I used to either just pull the hair and that helps me in my particular it helps. case. It helps me. Yeah. It completely uh, makes sound normal. Like the sound doesn't bother me anymore. Even weird sounds or loud sounds, but I have to keep doing that every mo few months or so, because for men, the hair grows back. There's literally hair yeah. growing out of like this part, you know, not the hair hair, but the ear. Men have actually, they have a yeah. genetic component, I think yeah. it's called the Y chromosome, and that causes hair to grow on the ears. Yeah. And that's why people say that mm. men are four times more to get diagnosed, you know, male people, uh, children, as opposed to women, oh. because of these sensory issues that yeah. are greater in, in men, because of the hair on the ears, because all that information, the sensory oh information, God, I, I never yeah. knew that. Yeah, this can only be told by a person oh. on the spectrum, like one who's lived through it. Although I have what you know, I just want to know. So it's too you much. You know what, firstly, right now you are, because my son is on, son is on spectrum, and the, and I feel like that you are. I am actually talking to you like you are being the translator for my son, and uh, that's why things that you have said can be so relatable, and I'm quite sure many people will benefit. Another question is firstly that uh, my son is nine and still non-verbal. What I should do further from for last six years, we are doing therapies. So I think okay, so uh, what uh, she is asking is I that can, uh, there are there's no. I have therapy. talked about this that uh, talk to your speech language pathologist and ask them about nursery rhymes and humming music. And I think it's called music therapy. And some people even refer to a form of it called dance therapy, where children are physically moving. And even though a child cannot speak, they can still imitate you physically like a dance kind of routine and that helps in the hand eye body brain coordination process that also happens when you when somebody plays computer games right it's hand eye coordination with your brain so i would suggest you talk to your speech language pathologist about that process and the research on it and try to involve that those two things as i mentioned the uh, you know the the, the, the use of rhythm, vocalization, music, and the use of dance, movement, and therapy uh, in the process of helping them build their underlying neurological structure that helps encourage that process. Uh, third, if they're nonverbal, they can, that doesn't mean they can't communicate. Sometimes they can write, sometimes children can uh, sign, do sign language, but they can use augmentative communication such as computers and technologies uh, to press button and text to speech and picture to speech. That helps them understand and communicate what their needs are. So that definitely is a mechanism that parents don't concentrate on because they're trying to focus too much on the speech, but the speech pattern requires yeah. other inputs. And another thing that 
I think uh, it's not really talked about really, is that sometimes a speech is actually connected to parts of your uh, neurological uh, functioning, right? The brain, the brain controls speech. We know that certain parts of the brain do, right? So what happens yeah. is you must stimulate parts of the brain physically through physical activity and exercise, certain kinds of exercise that is designed to stimulate certain parts of the brain. And that happens in a lot of developing countries now because it's not that expensive to do. The occupational therapist does this. So if you go to an educated occupational therapist or one who's current with the current research that's going on across the world, I believe they can provide you for the support, you know, in this area. Next. Uh, sorry. Next, did I answer that question? No, no, no. I said, okay, what uh, do you know the name of the tools that, that you mentioned? Are there certain tools, Tool? specific tools for occupational therapist? I think, or I just misheard, maybe. No, no, I didn't mention any tools, but the occupational therapist would know because this area of research fall, follows under their domain. So I'm not an occupational okay. therapist. I've never claimed to be. But I am aware that the kinds of interventions that an occupational therapist can advise you on would address these challenges based on the biological underpinnings that I've clarified. Like okay. they say the brain has a neurological system which defines, I think it's called you use it or you lose it. The mechanism by which neurology means you must stimulate parts of the brain. So the genetic conditions and uh, you know potentials exist among all of us but if we never use that part of our brain if it's never for example a child can go throughout their whole life without learning how to sing or dance or some other activity if they're never exposed to those activities then certain parts of the brain will never be stimulated will never be challenged will never other and hence those parts sometimes are connected to parts of the brain that go that's what oh. i'm talking about Okay. Okay. I just uh, asked like my son, he is nonverbal, but he uh, creates sounds and he has high sensory needs, especially oral needs. He mouths a lot and uh, I do many oral massages and he comes after that. But then after a few hours, he needs to do it again. So that's why his sensory diet is developed. So, so I, have, I have a question. Yeah. yeah. I have a question for you. Have you seen the electric toothbrush? Yes. Yes. I've actually ordered it so and I've been buying it. Yeah. 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 So I've so been and I think that brush, is helping know, him does, a lot. Does help. So yeah. I was just asking that because he's creating so much sound. Do you think that oral um, sensory needs are hampering his speech? Is that possible? Uh, again, these are questions that normally a neurologist would answer. Uh, but mm -hmm. I can just say statements based on what I've read or things that I've heard about or papers that I've witnessed at conferences. And a lot of the research studies that are happening right now are among people who, children who do make sounds and do a clear speech and stimulating that by exercise as well as by uh, encouraging them to sing or music through music therapy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because that stimulates part of the brains that help secondarily in speech. Okay. There's this question. Also the, uh, uh, I, I also really want to ask this. How did you deal with medical examinations when you were a child, for example, going through x-rays, medication, and while giving blood samples or injections? I don't think. Other than vaccines, I'm not really aware of any such things that I, I wasn't sick, so to speak. I didn't have to go for blood tests or x-rays or you never things went like that. Because uh, my son, he is uh, he hates when somebody holds him. So in uh, while doing his x-ray, he we wanted to get his x-ray done. And he, he had to stand in one position. And he couldn't. He wasn't because he's he's uh, he, he doesn't want to stand in one place. So we were trying to hold him. And he got very agitated. So how to, uh, to deal uh, in such cases? Yeah, so generally what happens, uh, again, medical professionals around the world are trained in these areas how to, uh, for example, dentists, yes. 
across the world. They're trained how to deal with children on the autism spectrum, or if you go through an MRI machine or other yeah. professionals around the world uh, are actually trained in doing this. But what generally happens, what I've seen actually observed myself in Pakistan is a lot of these people who are operating these technologies are lab technicians. They are not doctors. Yeah. No, and yeah, lab true. technicians have, you know, they're not even fully literate. Their maximum qualification is that they're a nurse or they've done some certificate course from somewhere. They're not proper medical doctors. A medical doctor who's read the research in, this, in, the, in the studies uh, in their particular area of specialization would be able, and they would know, because these are this information that's been shared for the last 20 to 30 years among scientists and you know academic journal across the world. So a professor, which is a, a, a kind of a medical profession who also teaches, is completely trained in the academic literature and the research part of things. And they are obviously throughout their lives, they read up and they learn about the new developments in the field and the academic journals and the research papers and so on. And that's where these things are normally discussed. In Pakistan, what I've generally seen, majority of machine operators are technicians who are not medical doctors. And hence, they're, they're not trained. They don't even know such a thing exists. Hmm. True. Okay, there's this another question. Uh, what kind of support did you find useful or helpful from relatives and strangers? And what can we do to create a better environment for people on spectrum as an individual and as a community? A very good question. Thank so you. What kind, of, what kind of support did I find helpful from strangers? Yeah, from what, any what kind of like support. For, for instance, you felt comfortable, like you were not comfortable in general around people, but were there some people no. who knew that you were uh, having some difficulty, so they were more comforting to you, or what they did was uh, more comforting? Nothing. No. I used to just avoid so, people. So uh, what would you advise, advise to others who have uh, children in their families and relatives who are on spectrum? How should they deal with them? Or how should they give yeah, okay. more care so, towards the child? So, so, yeah, so the first step is obviously for the parents to accept that autism is not a disease. There's no injection or cure as such. It's a lifelong condition. And it mm -hmm. can be you know, dealt with through therapies and through support uh, and through inclusion. And uh, these conditions, it becomes so minimal that your child can potentially live an independent, happy life and continue functioning as a regular, you know, as any other child. Obviously, it requires a lot of support over the years. However, I would also say that over the years, uh, we've seen greater acceptance through the media portrayals uh, of people on the spectrum or people with special needs. And uh, this has happened a lot in our neighboring countries, uh, more than our media. And uh, can you repeat the question? There were actually yes. two questions. The question was that how, what should you, what would you advise to people? Uh, as a community, as relatives, to be more humble or more uh, empathetic towards children and how to deal. If, for instance, if I know that I, in a family that I'm about to visit, has a child who's on spectrum, so how should be I have more be more careful? Well, generally, you you know you have to obviously ask the parents, you know, how does the child behave, what sensory issues or other challenges the child has, and also you have to understand the child. Uh, can understand what's going on around him. It's not that yes. there's an intellectual impairment. Yeah. The child can understand perfectly what's going on and probably will remember everything. Uh, so you just respect people as you would respect others. You know, if they have a challenge, if they're unable to communicate, then give them more time. Maybe they just need more time to communicate or they don't want to communicate. Well, respect that decision also. So I guess it's, a you know, what's happening in the last 15, 20 years across the world is that Inclusion has become a human rights issue. What's happened is that you know now mm. due the, the neurodiversity sort of uh, movement or sort of uh, you know shift is going towards you know that uh, inclusion is a human right. You know, and people on the spectrum, you know, or anyone with any kind of challenge, you know, inclusion only happens when you treat them like other people, uh, and you celebrate what they can do as opposed to what they cannot do. So true inclusion is not been achieved, obviously, in our society. Uh, still have a long way to go and uh, we get closer by learning from our neighbors and sadly because of politics uh, we are discouraged from doing so uh, i mean how hard is it to get a you know visa of our neighboring country or even go there it's near impossible 
uh, and uh, yeah. you know, I, I know because I've been there twice, and I know what I had to go through. So it was wasn't easy. Uh, it was very much probably the toughest thing I had to do in my entire life. But I I don't regret it. I I made incredible friends. I learned from people like me. I met people like me from across the world, and uh, I learned that it's the same story. What's happening here is happened here. Yeah. They have come very far ahead. Uh, they are probably twenty or thirty years ahead of us because of their large population. Because there are so many more people there, population-wise, probably five to six times more people. And there's more yeah. diagnosis there, acceptance is there. The society has opened up more. There are better media portrayals with the movies, the television, the TV series, all of that. And as a consequence, they are far ahead of us uh, because of their inclusion practices, which are best practices. They're trying to eliminate the rest. They're trying to create their own practices. They're trying to uh, you know, create new systems, but it's just a lack of interaction with our neighboring countries, especially in South Asia, politically, reason wise, yeah. is causing a problem. It's just going to hold us back because we're trying to emulate Western examples, which just won't work because they're for the West. Their society is different from our society. Our society yeah. is closer yeah. to other countries which are literally neighboring to us. We have to learn from them, and we're not. Mm. True. And uh, you have never been to any therapy? You didn't get any therapy? I was diagnosed uh, as having some kind of uh, dyslexia option. Uh, I guess I was, I think uh, when I, in all levels, I had a problem in mathematics. So I think the school teacher kind of sent me to a psychologist with the diagnosis. But I'm not sure how helpful that was. But uh, it was obvious. She didn't recognize the symptoms. She didn't ask me any questions regarding aspiration to my socialization. It was primarily regarding learning disability. You know, I had problems in mathematics. But other than that, uh, no. But okay. keep in mind that these challenges were so, like, as I said, I'm not the only one in my family. My family was a lot of other people, like, you know, relatives and so on, ancestors and so on. And as a consequence, they, they knew sort of generally what to do. Or generally, the kind of techniques that they also have done, or they, their parents or other people did. And as a consequence, uh, you know, they, you see, in a joint family system, it's very different from if you're living alone. In the West, you have the nuclear family where, you know, you have people living independently. And, and then that's where the challenge comes because the, parents, the grandparents don't live with the uh, family and they're not raising the kids. You know, they're in a special home or the retired home somewhere. So those dynamics are very different from our part of the world. That's why I mentioned the South Asia can they're in the developing. Uh, countries, you have a different model of society, and that's why our systems are different, our responses are different, our challenges are different, and we have to collaborate and learn from people with similar issues and similar social structures, as opposed to copying the West, which is not 100% implementable completely. Okay, there's this one question. Um, I think I'll just take just one more, and then I've taken a lot of your time. What uh, from uh, you feel comfortable with extroverts or introverts now? I only feel comfortable with people who share some kind of interest with example, as I did mention that you know I have subjects of my interest and I like to learn about them and talk about them and you know, share them with people who like the similar subjects in movies or you know ADL genres and so on. And that's the only people I feel comfortable with. Otherwise I I don't talk. Okay, okay uh, before you go, uh, you one thing I wanted to, uh, there's so many things still in my head that I want to ask you, but I won't take much of your time. Uh, one that, what was that one thing that you feel is if that wouldn't happen, I wouldn't achieve all of this and I wouldn't be this right now. You are. I, I can't hear you. What? Uh, I said, okay, what was that one thing in your life? that you think well i think i was lucky to have a supportive system support a family and uh, i guess that's what makes a difference you know support from the parents family and people around you that's probably what makes a difference among anyone's life it's a support system that you have. yeah system and unconditional love i think that is what our children need okay uh, firstly if someone wants to connect with you how can they connect well, my website is autismpakistan.org. All contact information is there. Okay. So I'll, um, and those who are asking, I'll, uh, uh, Fazli will send me the details and I'll uh, soon share all the details in the description. Thank you so much, Fazli, for doing this. I think uh, I, I have learned so much and you have been such a great help and inspiration. 
and thank you for giving me hope as a mother and i know so many people will get uh, so much hope and will learn so much from you and thank you so much and in the future i will definitely ask you to come back again and share more in uh, information and guide us better thank you thank you take yeah. care Okay, so for people, that was uh, firstly Azim. Um, I think, um, I think this is what I think right now because those who don't know, I have a son who is on spectrum, and uh, I think I I I was just uh, listening to him like he is translating things for my son as he's on verbal. And uh, I feel, I hope that mothers would understand that first thing, one thing that the school said that they are understanding everything. Don't think that they are not. Even if they're not paying attention, they are absorbing everything, positivity, negativity. So I think uh, when he was, uh, what Fazli just said, that he couldn't, achieve, he couldn't achieve all of this if he didn't have the support system he had. Let's be that unconditional empathy, full of empathy and unconditional love, uh, the support system for our children that they need, and they are going to flourish as well. Again, uh, those who want to connect with me, I will um, um, uh, give all the details in the description. I hope this video would have been very helpful. And thank you so much for all the queries, especially my dearest family members are also here. My panelists are also here. Uh, I just want to give an example. My my bhabi and my bhaijan are here in the comments below, and they are asking. And Alhamdulillah, they have perfectly beautiful child, and they are contributing and asking questions because they feel that they they a part important part for my son's life. So please be there for children who are even not yours, even if they are in your relative. As a neighbor, as a community, as a relative, you also play a huge role. So I think uh, even uh, family members like my bhabi and brother are uh, an example for me right now and everyone. So please teach everybody to be part of it. It's a teamwork. It raises a village to um, uh, raise a child. It, it takes a village to raise a child. This is what I believe. It's not just me who will do all the miracles for my child. So thank you so much. And uh, I hope this session will be helpful. I'll soon update the uh, YouTube link of the video also to share it as much as you can so people can get help and uh, can get support and hope as it's possible. I'll see you soon again in the next session. Take care. Allah. Peace.